ciągle iść w stronę słońca, w stronę słońca, aż po horyzontu kres. Iść ciągle iść, tak bez końca. I tak jeden przebudzony właśnie dzień. Hi everybody, welcome and thank you for attending, thank you for coming. Um, it's greatly appreciated. Um, I guess I should stand here next to the microphone. Welcome everyone and thank you for coming. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Ed Brzminski, um, Steffi's son. Uh, here. And those of you who do know me uh, know that I tend to go on and on and on, so you may want to tell Siri to set a wake-up call. <laughs> you can tell how this is going to go. Um, although Steffi came from humble beginnings, she did some pretty important things. She inspired a lot of people and touched many souls. She was an inherently happy person who loved to sing, she loved to dance, and be lighthearted. There she is dancing over there. The woman just always was moving around. She preferred a light Doris Day movie over Terminator 2, The Judgment Day. She actually was curious about space and science. She enjoyed watching movies with aliens. She was fascinated by a book from the early 70s by Eric von Danik entitled Chariots of the Gods. Those things were fascinating to her. She loved music. Is that me? Oh, it is me. Sorry. That's embarrassing. <laughs> I asked not to be interrupted unless it was absolutely. Um, I forgot that joke. Okay. Um, she loved musicals and lighthearted romance stories, but they were always with happy endings. As a child, I, I enjoyed watching those uh, shows with her too, because it was with my mommy. And as I got older, I started realizing that mom was haunted by some demons. Demons from long, long, long ago. Demons that dragged her mind into some really dark places. I didn't make the connection at the time, but those Doris Day movies, the science fiction stuff, the singing, the dancing, the happy ending movies were actually kind of an escape for her. Steffi was born in Lipa, Poland in 1921. Uh, her mother was named Katarzyna Kubrak, and her father's name was Valentin Podgórski. Um, the Podgórskis come from a long line of proud warriors who were actually praised by the Polish king. They were gifted land for their deeds. Her father, Valentin, died uh, before World War II. Some of Ste uh, Steffi's uncles uh, actually emigrated to the United States um, after World War I, but Steffi was too young um, to know them. Steffi had a couple of names. Stefania was her given name, and then she had a cute little name, Stefusha, and then that got shortened to Fusha. So in the early days, she was known as Fusha. In her later days in LA, people know her as Steffi. <clears throat> Lipa is in southeastern Poland near the city of Przemysl, close to what is now the Ukrainian border. According to Steffi, Lipa was in kind of the backwoods. But Steffi felt very cosmopolitan. She was a city girl at heart. So she moved to Przemysl, which was at the time the big city for her. And as a teen, she just loved the hustle and bustle. She really enjoyed it. She worked in a small shop owned by the Diamond family. Um, after a while, she started dating one of the sons. His name happened to be Isidore, Iju for short. So they had a nice little relationship, and in 1939, Hitler invaded Poland from the west, and the Soviets invaded Poland from the east. Things were okay for a bit because Premish was taken over by the Soviets, which for the young people here, those are the Russians now. But then Hitler attacked the Soviets and he took over all of Poland. And Przemysl was now under Nazi occupation. 
It was 1941. Steffi's mother and sister were sent to a work camp in Germany. Steffi went back to Lipa uh, to uh, get her little sister Helena and bring her with her to the city. Jews were being rounded up in a ghetto, a part of town that had a wall enclosing an area that was called a ghetto. It was meant to be a huge corral to keep the Jews inside, under control and in one place, including the Diamants. The Diamants trusted Steffi. They asked her to stay in her apartment, to take care of it until they returned. She visited them in the ghetto when she could, having to sneak in through some basement windows. Iju, her boyfriend, was sent to a labor camp in Lvov. Steffi went to try to see him, and they kind of hatched a plan to help him escape. She went back a few days later uh, to help him get out, and she saw his hanged corpse, presumably because he was plotting an escape. That was 1942. Iju's brothers, Max and Chaim, were herded onto a wooden freight car. There were no stairs to get in the rail car. It was chest high. An older woman was not able to climb up. The SS men herding people on the train used dogs. They used German shepherds and they used Great Danes to, oops. Somebody was coming through the other side. They used, they used these uh, German shepherds and Great Danes to keep people in check. During his testimony at um, the Adolf Eichmann trial in Israel in 1961, Max recounted how one SS man sicked his Great Dane on this old woman who couldn't get up on the train. It bit into her buttocks, tearing out a mouthful of flesh. He recalled how the old woman, in absolute terror, literally jumped onto the floor of that rail car. It was November 18, 1942, the second action, a process of clearing out the ghetto. The train was heading to Belzitz, Poland. The Germans called Belzitz a Vernichtungslager, which means an extermination camp. Max had worked at a dental lab and wanted to be a dentist, so he had with him a pair of pliers, and he managed to cut the barbed wire in the window. He hauled himself up through the window, and he crawled out and he hung on, and he dangled by one arm. While the train rounded a curve, he jumped, and he skidded in the snow, and he slammed himself chest first into a little telegraph pole. David, come on in. Have a seat. Let's see. The loaf of bread he hid under his shirt before he left and got on the train broke the impact of um, hitting a telephone pole. His brother in the train didn't want to jump. He said something to the effect of, let our blood be on their heads. Chaim went on to Belzitz, like his mother and father before, during that first action in the ghetto. So, um, Max went to his old friend's house. That friend told Max to stay put, and he would go out and get some things to clean him up. But something didn't feel right to Max. So he left, and he stayed outside and, and kind of watched as his old school chum came back to the house with a German patrol. He was going to turn him in. This was a confusing time. People did things from fear, from who knows what, but it was a confusing time. Max went to Steffi. She cleaned him up, she fed him. Later, Steffi went back to the ghetto and smuggled out his brother Henik and his fiancée Danusha. There ended up being too many people at that little apartment where they stayed and she needed a bigger place. So Fusha went out looking for a place for her people. She found a house for rent on Tatarska Street. It was Tatarska, excuse me, number three. It was a small one-story house, two rooms, a kitchen, and an attic. There was an outhouse, 
and a manual pump for water outside. There was no running water in the house. But for them, it was perfect. Max figured out a way to, up in the attic, make the attic a little shorter. They gathered up some wood, they built a little partition, and it, was, um, it wasn't very big. It was about six, seven feet high. It sloped down to about two feet, and it was about six feet, seven feet deep. Ultimately, 13 people ended up staying in that spot for two years. They had to figure out how to deal with food, how to deal with waste. There was no running water. There was a bucket. Everybody went in the bucket. And then Fusha and Helena, her sister, had to empty the bucket. Um, one day, Helena, this little girl, she was eight at the time, she was tasked with delivering a note to a couple more people in the ghetto that were coming to Fusha. She was a kid, so people thought she wouldn't be noticed. An SS man guarding the ghetto chased her. The note had the address and directions to Tatarska III. They could all be killed. Helena, this eight-year-old girl, being chased by the soldier, had the presence of mind to shove this note in her mouth and swallow it. Little eight-year-old kid. The, the guard caught her, but she didn't have any note. She didn't have anything. She was just a kid playing around. So apparently she kicked him in the shin and ran away. This is what everybody told me she did, so I'm sure it's not made up. And she got away. Ultimately, there were 13 people in the attic. My mom in Polish called them Szczęśliwa Czynastka, the lucky 13, her 13 ghosts. So when she passed away, I checked to see what was available as far as dates, and Saturday, October 13th was available. Hello, it made perfect sense. So here we are on the 13th. Um, my mom worked as a machinist. She made bolts and screws. She had a suitor, a young Polish boy, who apparently was really, she said he was really cute. But she couldn't date. She couldn't risk it. So she ended up finding, coming across a picture of an SS officer, a German military officer. And she showed it to him and said it was her boyfriend. That Polish boy was devastated in so many ways that the girl he likes is dating the enemy. And she was devastated because she wanted to be a girl. She wanted to date. She couldn't. Um, I have more written, but at about 4 o'clock this morning, I figured instead of me telling my mom's story, maybe my mom can tell her story in herself. So. It was one of the darkest times of modern civilization, a time when the flame of humanity and decency was extinguished, when six million were killed because they were Jews. It was the Holocaust, a time when courageous people rose above the brutality and risked their lives to save others. Steven Spielberg's film Schindler's List told us of one businessman who used his status as a Nazi to rescue almost 1,200 Jews. By now, I hope you've certainly made the effort to go see Schindler's List. Oscar Schindler was one of the angels of the Holocaust. And today, you're going to meet others who took personal stands and protected Jews from certain death in the hands of the Nazis. And after 50 years, we're also going to bring together three Holocaust survivors with the courageous man who saved them. But first, it's a story of love and dedication, which started when hate and brutality ruled. 
Stefania Bodgorska was a Catholic teenager when Hitler invaded Poland and began rounding up Jews to send to death camps. Her friend, Joseph Brzezminski, escaped from a train and turned up on her doorstep. Unable to turn him away, she hid him and ultimately 12 other Jews in her attic for two years. After Poland was liberated, Steffi and Joe were married. And Steffi and Joe join us today. Steffi and Joe, now married for 50 years. What happened when Joe appeared at your door? Well, he appeared at my door. And he asked me, when I opened the door, he asked me, he begged me just to help him. And, and you were what, 15? 16. 16 years old. 16. To, to help him, to, to take him for one night. How had you known him before? Oh, before I worked uh, with his uh, family, his mother. Uh -huh. They had a little uh, uh, grocery store. So I work with mother uh -huh. and I help her in the grocery store. So he comes to your door and he says, please let me stay here because... Help me only one night, only one night. Mm -hmm. But he looks terrible. So I said, come on in, come on, <laughs> don't stay too long there. He looked terrible, so I took him, and uh, he he was stayed not only one night, but a few nights because it was uh, impossible to to go someplace else. How and, many nights did he stay? Oh, seven nights. Uh huh. Seven nights. And then what happened? And then I went to around the ghetto to take some information what happened there. So it uh, was a little quiet in the ghetto, and I told him I came back. And he said, also because I was only one room, studio, there was no place. When somebody came, some friends to me, I hid him under the bed and covered bed with long <laughs> blanket. That because Weren't you afraid hiding him, though? Weren't you afraid for what could happen to you? And did the I rest knew. of your family know that he was being hidden there? No, my family didn't know. They didn't know? They didn't know. You were a good hider then. Well, I was afraid, of course, a little, but uh, that was a few minutes afraid. And then I said, I have to help. And so later he returned back to the ghetto. And it uh, was quiet, a little there. And then I was coming to the ghetto very often and to, to around and with my friends also. And uh, then when I one day heard on the street that ghetto will be liquidated, so I came to the ghetto, I said they probably will be ghetto liquidated. But already before they, uh, his parents, they were taking to concentration camp. Did you understand at 16 the horror that was going on around you? Were you aware of what we all now know? Was, were you aware that, pe that the Jews were being gassed and tortured? Well, I tell you the truth, I didn't understand a lot, but what I understood... That if you let him, if you had not hidden him, that he would, was going to die. I understood the that, is, that is terrible why these people have to die. For what? Because they're Jews. Because only they Jews. Mm -hmm. They they look like uh, like everybody else. Did you know oh. that you were going to die if you weren't hi weren't hidden, Joseph? Yes. Yes. I jumped from the any train. They took me from ghetto. Yeah. And with other people, and they pushed us to the train like a cattle train. Uh huh. Over a hundred people, and they said you will go for soap. You are fat people. And that's it. That they would make soap out of you. Yeah, and they mm -hmm. packed us inside. They was terrible inside. Now, you know, I've heard stories, and I had a fascinating conversation last year with Elie Wiesel, and one of the things he shared was that a lot of the people, a lot of the Jews at the time, were not aware that they were being marched to death camps, that they thought that perhaps they were going to have to go to work camps, but that a lot of people went and went sometimes willingly, knowing that times would be difficult, but not aware of the horror that awaited them. This was in the beginning, mm -hmm. where they made the ghetto. But later, Everyone some, knew. some people came back, escaped from the train, and told us what they were going. They put us in the train, which was going to the special camp. camp was, the name was Belzets. There was only for production. Nobody was working on killing and using human body like material for production. No uh, hair, 
for materials, skin, for leather, to make uh, anything, you know? There was only production. Uh -huh. And I broke the barbed wires. And you knew that that's I what know, you were going yes. for? Mm -hmm. And uh, I jumped to the running train, to the window. I wanted to commit suicide. The rest of my family was also on the train. Everybody disappeared. And I survived. I had... Uh, you jumped from the train to commit suicide? Yes. Yes, you were trying to kill yes. yourself. I said, no, I will not go for soap. I will kill myself. Mm -hmm. And I had a loaf of bread here, because when we were hiding in the bunker, they pick us up. The bread still I have here in a, in a belt and a coat. It was November 18, 1942. It was snow, it was cold in Poland. And when I was going first with my head forward, like by instinct, one time I wanted to commit suicide, something I had, no, do you will go under the running wheels because I saw the, 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 the racks and everything was, uh, was going fast. So I told them, put me back, and I was going with my, for, uh, f uh, my legs forward. I was hanging on the left hand outside. When the train was taking a curve, I jumped. And suddenly I felt a severe pain here in the chest, because I hit a post there. But the bread saved my life. There was a hole like a fist in the bread. And after a while, I came to a conscious, and I was seeing the, only, the train far away. I was running after the train, after the tracks, I mean, maybe some of my family jumped. I find two boys <coughs> who jumped also. One has broken the uh, collarbone, and one was the face scratch. Were you surprised you weren't dead, though? If I was dead? Yeah, you were surprised that you weren't dead because you were jumping to kill yourself. I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. I won't only commit suicide. And then was your, after you realized you're not dead, then was your mission to try to live? To survive. To survive. Yes. So the question is, how did you hide 13 Jews in your attic while living with two Nazis? Four Nazis, because these, uh, these two nurses, they had a boyfriends and soldiers. And every night, these soldiers, uh, every evening, these soldiers came to sleep with these girls. So every night I had... I like the way you say girls. <laughs> girls. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and these soldiers, they, they slept there with these girls. So you, how, how, weren't you afraid? What would have happened to you if they had found out that that's what you were doing? What would happen with me and my sister? Killed. Killed. That's all. That was one punishment. Killed. And, Public. uh, Publicly killed. Yes, yes. yes. And so, do you, do you know my, my feeling? Every night, when came these two soldiers and they locked and they went to sleep. Well, I a little talked to God. I asked God. And how long did you hide them? For how long? Eight months. Eight months. Eight months. How did you hide them? Everybody was in the attic in a box? No, no, no that was no box. No box? That, no. That, uh, uh, yes, they, they shot a little, uh, make shot at the little attic and they make false wall. And after this wall, they make... So, I so how large was the space? Oh, not maybe large. Maybe the... I'll let you explain the space when we come back. Okay. We'll be back in a moment. The Holocaust Memorial Commission in Israel has a special honor for rescuers like Steffi. A tree is planted with a plaque, and the rescuers are designated righteous Gentiles. And Steffi has received this honor when we come back. So what we want to know is how you were able to hide 13 Jewish people in your attic in a Nazi home and how big the attic was, how big was the space? So this was about two yards. The two roof yards. was going like in an angle. 13 we, people in a two-yard space? Yes. We were sitting like sardine in head, legs, head, legs. This is our position. For eight months? For, for over two years. Over two years. Over two years, but the higher part, this was like our toilet. No, there was a bucket, and if somebody had to do something, was going there. There was no per, uh, personal things. Have to do, have to do. And at night, she was taking out, <sighs> you know, uh, with hygiene, with washing. Sometimes we were watching, one person was going down fast, with water wash and run up. Wow. There was a ladder. Mm. And with uh, 
you know, there was like ranks were going on the attic. The wall was exactly like the old one. And on the bottom was a small door, which always was opening, and to put a little fresh air. When we heard somebody's going up on the ladder, we closed. And this is what I had from the sitting over two years like this, because I was on the bottom, and I was opening and closing the doors. I was lying like this. Show, that, show us that again. This, the, yeah. this is scoliosis I have, you see? Uh-huh. From Fine. sitting okay. uh -huh. over two years in this position. We couldn't walk. We couldn't talk. We didn't talk when you were whispering, walking. Only you couldn't some, walk because people would hear you. Yes, only sometimes we went down to wash. So this was on the ladder down, uh, up. For two it. years? Yes. How did you feed them? Where did you get the food to feed them without being found out? Well, I tried to, to, to buy food and I uh, pretended with, to my friends and, and uh, neighbors that I am buying food and then selling food to make a little money. <laughs> mm -hmm. But when I brought the, the both food, I brought home was heavy bags. Then when I went out, I work in factory. So sometimes I took the bag and I pack something, papers or something that neighbors will see that I am carrying from home food to the factory to sell. <laughs> Did you ever think you would be found out? Oh, Every otherwise I thought that maybe I will find out somehow, some, and I will be killed. I, every night when I went to sleep, I talked to God, I asked God to protect me and my little sister to help me that I can help these people. Every, every day. I cannot tell you what I felt because nobody can un understand that. Every day was like 100 years. There was no day that something not happened. Every time <laughs> something's happened, that we can lose the life and she can lose the life. Every time. There are many, many stories. So 13 of you sat in that attic for two years? Over two years, yes. Until the war was over? Mm, yes. And one episode only, I will tell you. One day came to me two SS men, and they said to me, they gave me only two hours to move out of my apartment. Oh. And I asked why. They said, because they opened, they, uh, opened the military hospital across my home, and they needed apartments for their, their personality, for themselves. Around that was family, and he said that we are only two girls, so we can go out. And they gave me two hours. And you know all these people are in your attic. <laughs> no, she was holding us. So, so what did you do? Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> wait. Okay. <clears throat> so, they, this SS man said, if they will come with two hours and I will be still the, at home, they will kill me and my sister. I, I said, all right. I didn't have choice. When they left, I went to the attic. I told my people what happened. Two hours they gave me to move out of my apartment. So all 13 came to me, embraced me around, and they said, listen, Steffi, you have to run away. Take your little sister. You cannot help us anymore, but save yourself and your sister. We probably have to die. There's no choice, but you not have to. You cannot help us anymore. Take your sister and go, run away. <sighs> I said, first of all, I will run to the city and ask maybe will be some apartment. And I ran and I look around and here and there and in two hours, you cannot find apartment. Right. I can find, I can go to, to, to my friends for a few days before later I can find. But you can't take 13 but people. 13 people. Right. I, I just also, I, I couldn't leave them. So 
was 15 minutes left. I came, came home and I told them, no apartment. And they all still came around me. They said, run away, you have still 10 minutes. Run away, don't stay, don't, you don't have to die with us, run away. And some of the cry was three children and they look at me and they touched me and they, they hold me. They didn't say nothing, but they, they squeezed me. And I look on these 13 people and I felt inside, I cannot leave them. So what happened? People. What happened? And I told them, I will not leave you. And they were like a shock. I said, go on the attic, go to your bunker and stay quiet. We will see what will be. I will not leave you. So when the SS men came back, what happened? SS man came back exactly two minutes and uh, they said, that's all right that I not uh, moved because they will take only one room and in the other room I can stay with my sister. Miracle. It's oh. a miracle. That is a miracle. So my mom was, um, she was a, a, a very deeply Catholic woman. Um, she wasn't a practicing Catholic. She didn't go to church. During that episode, she said, um, well, in that episode of the SS men coming, she said um, she kind of heard a, a voice in her head just say, a woman's voice, just say, everything will be okay, don't worry. And she, um, she just felt this calm wash over her. And she said, um, that's when she told her, her people, it'll be okay. She later said, I think it was, you know, Matka Boska, uh, Holy Mary. During those years, she had these pictures with her. She would pray to these pictures of uh, Jesus and Mary. And these are the actual ones from, from that house. She told me that after, there were so many things that went on, that um, all the 13 people there um, knelt and pray to that picture because they said our God gave up on us. We'll pray to Jesus. And that was a big thing. I, you know, that's a big thing. A, a lot of the people who, who survived, they converted to Christianity. Um, they abandoned their Judaism. Some stayed Jews, some stayed, became Christians. So you could see on her face, you could see the stress, you could see the tension. That was her life for so many years. She gave up her, her childhood. And, um, you know, she came down with dementia. Um, and honestly, I have to say, dementia is a terrible, terrible disease. But it freed her. She ended up forgetting that stuff. She was able to be a, a young child, a, a young girl, and she was happy, um, laughing a lot. Let me tell you a little bit more about Steffi. Oh, hi. Oh, hi, my darling. Oh, no worries. Bring it in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, so Joe became a dentist. He, oh, he changed his name from Max. He was Max Diamant. He changed his name to Joe Berzminski. Why? Because after the war, um, there were still some ignorant people who didn't like Jews, and they were running around beating them up. They were called pogroms, and some of them were being killed. So my dad didn't want to die. He didn't want the family to die, so he took the name of a Polish person. Joseph Bersminski. He went on to become a dentist. Um, they, uh, he was doing well in Poland as a dentist. My mom was a dental assistant. Um, and he, under the Soviets, he was asked to become, or told to become a communist. He said, I don't want to be a communist. I said, well, you ain't going to work. So he said, well, crap, what do we do? Because he was Jewish, the Soviet Union had a relationship with Israel that they could uh, leave. Because under communism, you couldn't leave um, easily. So they moved to Israel for a couple, for three or four years. They started a dental practice there. Uh, they learned Hebrew. 
But they had wanted to come to the US. They wanted to come to America. And they were sponsored by somebody in Chicago. And when they arrived in New York, my dad said it was like a dream come true. He would never have thought, coming to America? It's amazing. He got accepted to Tufts Dental School because he couldn't be a practicing dentist. Even though he was for many, many years, he had to go to dental school all over again. So at 47, he goes to dental school. Um, uh, this is in 1962, and he's from a communist country, and he's going to school with a bunch of 20-year-olds, so he took a lot of crap. Um, he didn't know the language very well, but he knew the stuff in Latin that was written in the textbooks. He kicked butt on the practicals, because he had like 20 years of dental experience on these kids, but uh, we're in the labs. Uh, Steffi, my mom, started a home-based business. She learned to be a seamstress. Uh, to help make ends meet while the dental practice was growing. I remember her on her hands and knees as I was a kid, you know, hemming ladies' dresses, and there was stuff stacked all over the place. She sewed pretty well. She sewed a lot of her own dresses um, as a way to save money. Why spend money? I can make the dress. Um, so Joe's, my dad's dental practice went well. He was a one-man shop. Steffi assisted. And all that stress was building up, and she needed to write it all down. She needed to commit it to, to, to paper. Could this stuff have really happened? So she worked for almost 10 years on a memoir. And my mom, she never told me. And I don't think she had much of an education. Uh, she didn't have time to get an education. So she wrote with her chicken scratch, and then typed two fingers, like the several hundred page manuscript. She did pretty well. And she committed everything into paper. So after a while, my dad stopped practicing dentistry because at 77, his hands started to shake. And it was freezing cold in Boston. And I had already moved here. My sister had moved here. Pop, come on. It's zero degrees in Boston. Come to San Diego. It's like 75. So my mom shows up. We got him an, apart uh, uh, an apartment. She shows up. I'm in shorts and a tank top. She comes off the plane, all bundled up with this big, long coat. Oh, it's cold. Oh, it's not cold. <laughs> <laughs> she took to the shorts. She took to the, the short sleeves uh, pretty quickly. She enjoyed it. Uh, they moved up to Los Angeles. We met some wonderful people. Um, by that time, the dementia started to settle in. And she started to do some really fun things. Um, say some really fun things with people. And that trip right there, um, that was a, a cruise to Ensenada from um, San Pedro. So we're boarding. It was my mom, me, and my stepdaughter, Nicole. Oh, and, and my dad. So we're boarding, and the, the, the passports are being checked. And um, there's a guy who my mom would say was corpulent. He was heavy. And he was checking passports. He was kind of sitting on a table like this with his gut hanging up. So you know, the filters start to come down. And my mom looks at him, and she pokes him in the gut. And she says, you need to lose weight. <laughs> the guy just was like, oh. Um, when Lori, my wife, and I took my parents to uh, San Francisco just after 9-11, um, when we were coming back, that's when security got imposed. You, you had to go through the security check. And we're standing in line. This, nobody had known about this. We didn't know what to do. We're just standing in the lines and walking through. And there's soldiers. I don't know if they're Marines or whatever. But they're standing there with their M16s hanging here, their, their guns. And my mom really does not like men who are armed in uniform. So she's getting in his face. She's poking him in the chest. Don't you tell me what to do. And the guy's like, he doesn't know what to make of her. And I'm standing in the other security line going to the guard. Like, <laughs> he's looking at me. He's looking at her. Really? So I, I come over. I'm like, Fusha, you know, relax. It's OK. <laughs> she became a handful. <laughs> And those of you who know her for a long time know how much of a handful she became. She was a good lady. She was a really, really good lady. Um, uh, I want to share with you just a couple of stories, and I want to thank some people who are here. Um, why did Steffi do what she did? 
she kind of alluded to it. You know, for her, people are people. She just saw what was going on was just wrong. You know, there, some people were different, some people maybe dressed differently, but it was just wrong. So um, she had to help. She was young, and her dad's, she told me her dad instilled in her that, you know, it doesn't matter. People are, are people, so she helped. Um, that helping didn't end uh, after the war when we lived in Boston. Um, there was a fire in an apartment building just around the corner from us. It was a big building. A lot of people were left homeless. Uh, it was raining. I went out there. I was looking. I was helping. I went back to talk to my parents. And I said, you know, there are people that don't have a place to go. They didn't even think twice. They just kind of looked at each other. They didn't really say anything. They just kind of looked at each other with this acknowledging look. And together they said, well, bring them over. We mean bring them over. Bring them over. So we had nine people stuffed in our apartment in, in Brookline for like three weeks until they found a place to live. Those were just the kind of people that they were. Um, uh, you know, I had a little bit of an insight to her when we traveled to Poland in the 1980s when it was still a communist country. There was a young man, there was a writer that rewrote my mom's manuscript. His name was Kenny Sidman uh, in, in Boston. And um, we couldn't get out of Poland. We were getting on a train. We were in, in, in Przemysl. We were, we were going to go to Paris. But there were no tickets. So we're at this ticket counter, and there's this staunch Polish lady back there. Mm -hmm. No tickets. So I watched my mom kind of go back into her war mode. And she takes the passports back. She, you know, they looked at the passport. She took it back. She slipped a $20 bill in her passport. And she says, maybe Miss can look again. Uh, there might be something you overlooked. And I, you know, this, for me, was just like a, a movie. So the passport slides across the desk, opens up, and like, flips down like this, and the $20 bill falls in that lady's lap. She says, oh, let me check. <laughs> oh, four seats just became available. <laughs> OK, so we got on this train. And at the time, in Poland, you couldn't take money out of Poland. Because why? I don't know. Communists don't take the money out of Poland. So there were three uh, police officers. One woman was a senior officer and two, two men who were, I guess, the junior officers. And they're walking through, checking passports. Give, me, give up your cash, give up the money. So she, sits, she comes over to my mom, and my mom starts chit-chatting with her and making small talk. And they end up, after like 10 minutes, they're chuckling with each other. And my mom says, oh, why don't you come to America? The lady says, oh my god, I'm never going to get to America. That's a dream. And this, this Polish woman officer who's now chuckling, well, she says, keep the money. It's not worth anything anyway. Keep it as a souvenir. So then we got to the East German border. And you know, the staff changes again. And I'm looking out as we're approaching the East German border. And up on the platform are East German soldiers, you know, guards. They're wearing the whole Nazi outfits, just not the swastikas. And I'm like, wow, look at that. So they came onto the train, because they're checking passports. German is a hard language. When it's spoken loudly, it's barked. And my dad said that he was, over the years of Nazi occupation, they were trained to respond to the bark, to hear the bark. And, you know, so these two guys, two soldiers, came on. I guess they were customs people or whatever. But they're looking for passports. Passport, bark, bark, passport. So I was like, dude. Um, and they're looking at the passports. And Kenny, the writer, he's Jewish, his last name is Sidman, he was a little combative. Because the, 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 they're looking at it going, Sidman, huh? Sidman. And Kenny's going, what? what what's, what's, what's the problem? My mom's like, shh, 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 shh. So she fell into her little coquettish 18-year-old. And she started chit-chatting with the guys in, the, in a little German, a little Polish. It didn't quite work well with them because she was in her 40s. So, mm -hmm. um, 
But anyway, it, it ended up working out okay. But I got a little insight into how she was way back when. And it was just mind-boggling to me. And then she comes back and she becomes my mom again and it's a normal person. We met a lot of people over the years, um, particularly in Los Angeles, um, in, in Boston in the early days. How did my mom get recognized as a righteous Gentile? Um, in 1979, several of the people who were rescued got together and contacted Yad Vashem in Israel. Yad Vashem is a place that um, recognizes, one of the things they do is recognize people who helped, uh, non-Jews who helped Jews. And uh, they were going to plant 13 trees in my mom's honor. So she got recognized by Israel and Yad Vashem in 1979. And things started to go from there. Um, the mayor of Boston, Ray Flynn at the time, honored my mom. Um, there was a guy named Cy Rotter in Washington, DC, who um, uh, wanted to uh, create documentaries. He created a documentary about my mom called, and dad called The Other Side of Faith. We went to Poland together. My dad hadn't been back to Poland since then. This was the 80s. Um, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, recognized mom, and actually she got to speak at the dedication of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. I have a picture in the slideshow where she's talking. She got to meet uh, the President of the United States and, and the Vice President, the First Lady, and the Vice First Lady, um, which to them was like, oh my gosh, coming from the backwoods in Poland. They're meeting the President of the United States. He was really kind of amazing and dignitaries from all over uh, the globe. Um, there was a lady who was one of my clients uh, at Los Angeles Lawyer Magazine at the LA County Bar Association. Her name is Susan Pettit. I've lost touch with her, but I owe her so much. She, she heard my parents' story, and she contacted a friend of hers at Hearst Entertainment and got them as a segment on a TV show called In the Name of Love. Kendall, could you open that door? Oh, yeah, that's Denise. Come on in. We were just getting to you. <laughs> just in time. Always a time for the kids. <laughs> and uh, you saw the Oprah show. We got to uh, be on the Oprah show. And these two lovely people who just entered, you're actually, you're right on cue. Come on in. These two fine people, uh, Denise, uh, after, um, after this 1979 thing made national media uh, attention, Denise was, uh, she's been acting for many, many years, uh, television and, and, and movies and film. She contacted my parents and said um, that she'd like to make a movie out of this story. This should be a movie. So she came to visit um, in, in Boston and um, worked out an arrangement with my folks. And Denise worked tirelessly for 10 years. 14. 14 years <laughs> to get this movie made. At the time, it was another Germans and Jews story. So people weren't necessarily buying. Um, it took Schindler's List, I think, to kind of get the ball rolling, to get the interest going in the industry. And um, Denise became a family friend through that time. She knew this man, Richard Cola, who has directed a lot of television movies and I think other movies, a lot of stuff. <laughs> so Denise um, managed to talk Richard into participating <laughs> and, uh, in, in the movie and getting the movie made. So there was um, Hidden in Silence was made uh, and filmed in the Czech Republic and it was done very, very well. One of the things that my mom was adamant about, this is not a love story. This is about people. This is not about Joe and me. And my father was like, what do you mean? I, mean, I love you. Where is no, it's not about us. <laughs> that caused a little consternation, but it ended up working out. And thanks to YouTube, there is something that is memorialized um, that's going to go beyond us, that will be uh, a testament to my mom and dad and, and what they did. So I owe you guys a 
huge, huge gratitude. Um, uh, there was a young lady who played my mom. Her name is Kelly Martin. And I had the good fortune of being an extra on this film. I called Denise when she was in um, Europe. We were starting to film. I said, Denise, I want to be in the movie. She goes, oh my gosh, no. <laughs> I said, no, I don't want to be in the movie. I want to be an extra. I just want to experience. She said, all right, come over. So I came over. I could tell you were frustrated. You're like, oh, gosh, I've got to accommodate this guy. No, it worked out for you. <laughs> You're very sweet. I got to be an extra on the movie. And I got to see one scene, or watch one scene, where Kelly, who's playing my mom, goes from Shemesh back to Lipa to the farm looking for her mom. And Kelly was 18 at the time, I think she was 18, and she took this part so passionately. She was so into this role. She's running around the house, knocking on the windows, yelling, Mama, Mama. And she felt so passionate about it after the scene was done, which is cut. She comes running back to the van in tears. She was an absolute wreck, this girl, because she felt that pain. And you know, she just disappeared in the van. It just, it, that scene just stays in my head. It, it just moved me um, that she was so passionate about it. Um, another lady in Los Angeles, uh, Beata Posniak, uh, Beata Posniak Daniels, who founded Women's Day USA. Um, she, uh, she, this lady is an actress, um, television, some film. Um, she, this lady is just unstoppable. Has energy beyond belief. She. Uh, helped recognize my mom um, at one of the Women's Day, two of the Women's Day events, and um, very grateful for that. Um, so you saw the personality, you saw my mom's face, you saw the stress. That's why I say the the dementia, with the flash before the flashbacks, the spontaneous crying, the post-traumatic stress that she endured. She never acknowledged it. You didn't acknowledge it. You just sucked it up and you did what you needed to do, but that just beat her up, and I know that that caused the dementia or contributed to the dementia. But like I said before, that dementia freed her. She was singing, she was laughing, she forgot it. She forgot me, and it's like, okay, but she's happy. She's singing Polish stuff, she's really doing well. Um, so, then there was, a, as she started to decline in recent years, we found a place for her uh, in Tarzana, uh, a home and uh, a residential care facility for the elderly. And uh, it's called Marble Terrace. And they, it was owned by a Polish family. Oh my gosh, in Los Angeles, a Polish place for the elderly. So um, we were able to get my mom in, into um, the Polish place. Elizabeth Godlewska is here with her. She owns the facility. And Bonnie um, Kozbiel uh, is the administrator. Yes. She, she, these two and her staff watched over mom um, until she passed away. And they did a phenomenal job. I thank you so much for taking care of her. I also need to thank my wife because she only once asked me, how much are we spending to support your mom? And she only asked me once, and never asked me again. She never questioned. We always gave what we needed to give. And she, you know, she supported us, me, in doing that. So I'm honored to have some honored representatives here. Um, Marla Abraham is here from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, in Washington, DC, and it's the West Coast office. Um, Marla, I, would you like to? Thank you. Uh, it's actually my ninth day on the job. Um, <laughs> I cannot imagine what tomorrow will bring. Um, I'm going to share with you a letter from the founding director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I just have to say, um, I met Ed this morning, and after watching your, your folks, um, they are so in you, and so much of the welcome and the, the heart that I feel here this morning. Uh, here goes the letter. To the family and friends of Stefania, 
Fedorska Brzezinski. On behalf of all of us at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, we wish to extend our heartfelt condolences to you on the loss of this remarkable woman. We were deeply honored to have known her, and we have such fond memories of her from the day the museum was dedicated, just about 25 and a half years ago. Who can forget that bitter cold, rainy, windy day when 10,000 people, including many heads of states, gathered to open a museum that many people question. The doubters felt the Holocaust was a European story or a Jewish story and did not belong in Washington, D.C. They did not see it as a human story that revealed significant truths about mankind and its capacity for extreme evil and extreme good. It was the presence of Stefania that day that began the crucially important effort to share with the world, with the world the lessons of the Holocaust about human nature and especially the power of the individual. Her heroism at such a young age and under the very brutal German occupation that Poland suffered is an extraordinary example of physical and moral courage. It began with food and ended up providing shelter to Jews, every single one of whom was targeted for death. And in Poland, as was mentioned, helping a Jew was punishable by death. As things got worse for both Jews and Poles, Stefania could have understandably lessened her heroic gestures. Most people would have, but she did not. She took her actions even further. Under the most horrific and dire circumstances, she maintained her own humanity and worked to provide human dignity at a time when very few did. She was rightly recognized by Yad Vashem as a righteous among the nations and in the permanent exhibition of our museum. Her exceptional legacy lives in those two institutions and in the lives of those who owe their survival to her. She lived a long and consequential life. Her story will inspire countless new generations. Stefania's legacy endures for the ages. Sincerely, Sarah Bloomfield, director. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, when somebody has passed away, uh, we say, Zichrona Livracha, may her memory be for a blessing. I am sure that it is. Thank you very much. Um, Poland has also um, uh, sent a representative here, uh, Mr. Ignacy Zajewski, who is the uh, Arts and Culture Director? Attaché. Attaché. Would you like to say a few words? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, what a, what a powerful story. What a great family. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a great honor. Uh, I'd like to say, first of all, uh, my condolences uh, to, to the family. And uh, I represent the uh, Polish Consulate in Los Angeles. Uh, and on behalf of the Consulate, uh, I am paying tribute uh, to Stefania podgórska Bożmińska, a great Polish citizen, uh, the righteous among nations, and a great person. Uh, she uh, saved the life of 13 people who were in need, that we, we heard the story. She, uh, she saved the life of uh, 13 Polish Jews. And uh, she was a bright star on the dark sky of the dramatic events of the Second World War. Um, when Poland was invaded by, by the Nazi Germany. And uh, I think I should say something in Polish. Sure. Thank you, Stefania. Dziękuję, Stefania. Thank you very much. The mayor of Los Angeles has also um, asked Angie Aramayo, uh, the mayor's central area representative, to um, with us to be with us. Angie, would you like to come up? Hello, 
Hello, everyone. So again, my name is Andrew Amayo. I'm the Central Area Representative. Unfortunately, the mayor couldn't be here, but he did write a letter that I would like to read to the family and to the friends of, um, I'm blanking out her name, Steffi. <laughs> Steffi. <laughs> so it reads, Ed, Christina, and family and friends of Stefania. When extraordinary angel in the city of angels passes on, all of us grieve and mourn, recall the life well lived, and celebrate what that person brought to our communities and to our world. Yet when a woman like Steffi leaves, we do far more than remember. We have stock on what we learned from her unmatched heroism, her unrivaled bravery, and her unquestioned courage. Steffi hid 13 Jews in an attic at a time when doing so was a death sentence. But she knew it was right and just, and her long life and decades since the Holocaust presents the ultimate answer to the Nazis' cruelty. She saved lives, she survived, she outlived those who might, might have ended her life. There is no greater testament to the strength of Steffi's determination and spirit. One of the great sages of Jewish history once said that in a place where no one is human, one should strive to be human. Steffi's story teaches us all what it means to be human, to embrace our common humanity, and to live up to our values, and to be one of the righteous among the nations. Each of us can take a lesson from Steffi's remarkable life. May the thoughts and prayers of so many in this city help bring a small measure of solace and support to everyone who grieves at this time. Signed sincerely, Mayor Eric Garcetti. So on behalf of Mayor, I'd like to present you this letter as a small token of appreciation. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, we got the and also, the mayor did win a um, Oh, wow. Present you with an in memoriam, sir, for Steffi. Oh, wow. Just as another way to thank her, to thank the family of all the work that you've done as well. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Look at that. Thank you very much. See that, Mom? Vieta uh, Pontiac Daniels, uh, on behalf of Women's Day USA, would you like to come up? I'm Beata Pozniak, and I am, uh, besides being an actor, director, producer, I am also a founder of um, Women's Day USA which is an organization that recognizes women's achievements on International Women's Day. And it's a day that I worked with the Congress and Senate and introduced it in 1994 in this country. And uh, Stefa Fusha was one of our honorees in 1996, and it was a true joy. Uh, I'm Polish, she's Polish, and she, spoke Polish and she was so excited to be part of this new community and from Poland and sharing what it is to be able to make a difference as a Polish person and being here with us. And, and we honored her for her tremendous heroism during the World War II. Um, and I have here a special um, certificate of recognition that was given to me. Uh, I'm representing um, on the behalf of Senator Ben, Al ben Allen from the 26th uh, District, who also is the Vice Chair of Legislative Jewish Caucus. And he sends uh, this certificate of recognition, and I'd like to share it with you. In memoriam, Stefania Podgórska Puzminska, a shining example of heroism and courage who saved the lives of 13 Jews in Poland during World War II and performed other selfless acts throughout her life. The world is a better place for having her in it. May she rest in peace. Senator Ben Allen, 26th District and Vice Chair, Legislative Jewish Caucus, October 13th, 
2018. Yad Vashem in Israel also sent uh, a letter to, uh, to be read and um, no, 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 no. Okay, did somebody have the letter? I gave you guys the letter. It's what? In the post. In the post office. Oh. So I guess my daughter's not going to read it. Okay. So from Yad Vashem in Israel, dear family, it is with great sorrow that we have heard of the passing of Stefania Podguska Bozminska. On behalf of the chairman of our directorate, the Commission for the Designation of the Righteous, and all of us at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, I kindly ask you to accept our profound condolences. Please convey our sympathy to the entire family. We at Yad Vashem are committed to preserving the memory of Brzezminska Stefania, who was honored by our institute in 1979 for her courageous actions in the saving of Jewish lives during the Holocaust in Poland. The trees planted in her honor in the Avenue of the Righteous here at Yad Vashem bears witness to an outstanding individual who acted nobly during the darkest time in Jewish history. Her humanitarian deed is documented in Yad Vashem's Encyclopedia of the Righteous and will inspire future generations. I assure you that we will continue to impart this story in the spirit of the saying of our sages, whoever saves one life, it is as if he saved an entire universe. With our heartfelt sympathy, Joel Zis... Let me work on this. Joel Zisenwini, Director, Righteous Among the Nations Department. So what's coming in the future? There are several more people that I'd like to uh, recognize too, but what's coming in the future? Um, the story hasn't ended, and I was up until 3 o'clock this morning, so I need to rely on my notes. So give me a minute. Uh, one sec. Okay. Now there's another lady that I'd just uh, like to thank. Her name is Diane Jacobs. She's probably 150 years old. The, the woman was at the Munich um, Olympics in, in Germany, in Nazi Germany. She actually saw Hitler. She sat, like, close to Hitler. She's a, a Jewish girl. And she became, in the United States, she became a leader of the California Republican Congress, Republican Party, just a powerhouse lady. Uh, you don't want to be on the wrong side of her. Uh, she, is, she got things done for my mom. She worked tirelessly to get my mom recognized wherever and whenever possible. Um, she was, I've lost touch with her, but she was such a wonderful lady. And if you ever wanted anything done, oh my God, you got her involved. Um, really great person. Christina Navarro is one of the rescued. She lives in Brussels. Just the sweetest lady. Um, my parents were like her parents, uh, and she was devastated when I told her that my mom passed away. Um, she was so kind, always so warm, coming over here. We went over to Brussels. She's just the warmest lady. Um, close family. Okay, so what's happening? What's going on? going forward. Well, I've lost my notes. So here's what's going forward. We were in Poland um, a little while ago in spring and um, going to visit with a gentleman who actually bought the house on Tatarska 3. And um, he wants to make it into a museum. So we went over, Lori, Mia, and I went to Poland to visit with the guy. He's just the ni nicest guy. He wants to turn this into um, remembering the story and having it continue, which is such a wonderful thing. The guy's a builder, he's renovating the place. The place is a dump, so it needs the renovation. Um, I won't share his name yet because he doesn't want to have publicity yet. It'll be done sometime in a year or so, and um, uh, then he, he, he'll have the publicity. Um, a teacher from Poland, from Szemesz, reached out to me just kind of randomly on Facebook in February. And she connected with me because she wanted to find out what happened with my mom and Helena. There was not, the information stream just got cut off um, on the internet. So she just re she started chatting, 
And I said, well, we're coming out there. She says, oh my gosh, that'd be great. Can you come and talk to our class? So we were able to come and talk to, to the class. Apparently, she teaches history, and she teaches about my mom in French. So the story continues beyond us. Um, and roughly about a year or so ago, uh, we were, I was contacted by a, um, uh, a writer that uh, wanted to, was putting together a novel, and wanted to put a novel together with Scholastic Press for young adults. And um, Sharon Cameron, uh, Sharon over there, she, um, she's writing a novel, she's in the midst of it, and next week, in a week and a half or so, we're traveling to Poland, so she can visit with in Przemysz, she can interview my Aunt Helena and Christina in Brussels to make the story as Real. As real yeah, um, as, as it can be. So um, the story is going to continue through young adults long before I'm gone. I mean, after I'm gone. It'll be before I'm gone when it's published, but after I'm gone, it's going to continue. And, um, uh, and of course, you know, my daughter, too. She's hopefully will carry the story forward. Um, Sharon, would you like to say anything, or are you okay? Sharon flew in from Nashville. From I can say something from here. I, I just, I would like to say um, in front of everyone that I, I saw um, Ed's mother's story um, because of the oral history projects that were done through the Holocaust Museum. Um, and that was probably 23 years ago, I think. And I never forgot it. Um, it stayed in my mind. It was long before I ever thought that I would write books. and. Um, when I went back and looked for that interview and didn't even know her name, but I was able to find it um, so easily on the website. And I watched the entire oral history interview three times. And I knew that this just absolutely needed to be a story that um, it needs to be told right now in our world because it was just such, um, and your mom was just such a resourceful, resilient, brave, courageous, kind person and who did what was right, no matter what. Um, and I think that's a story that we all need to hear. And so I'm, I'm very glad I got to meet her the one time that I did. And I appreciate all you're doing to facilitate the story coming out. Thank you. And um, I also asked uh, Father Rafael uh, from the Polish Church in Los Angeles um, to be with us today. My mom was a deeply religious person, but she, again, she wasn't a practicing Catholic. Um, she practiced inside, and her church was wherever she was. Um, she, when she was in Poland, she went to church often for, for guidance. She believed deeply in Jesus and, and, and God. Um, and, but because of how she lived her life, I wanted the service to be representative of her life, but I also wanted Father to be here because she is so deeply Catholic. Um, and I, he just learned about this like two or three days ago. So he's coming in cold. <laughs> but thank you so much. Would you like to? Ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters, in one God, thank you for your invitation uh, that is deeply honor and privilege to be here with you and to pray in her first language in Polish. Uh, thanks be to God for her beautiful life, for her wonderful heart. Uh, again, condolences for you, for your family, for everybody, uh, especially for Jewish community. Okay, let's, let's pray together. Stand up, please. W imię Ojca i Syna i Ducha Świętego. Amen. Pan z Wami i z Duchem Twoim. Boże, Ty sprawiłeś, że Twój Syn zwyciężył śmierć i wstąpił do nieba. Daj Twojej zmarłej służebnicy, Stefani podgórskiej Burzmiński udział w Jego zwycięstwie nad śmiercią, aby mogła na wieki oglądać Ciebie, swojego Stwórcę i Odkupiciela, 
przez Chrystusa, Pana naszego. Amen. Boże, otwórz nasze serca na Twoje słowa, abyśmy w ciemnościach znaleźli światło, w, nasze, w naszych wątpliwościach pewność płynącą z wiary, w naszym smutku pociechę przez Chrystusa, Pana naszego. Amen. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I am I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Master, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jezus powiedział do apostoł. Ja jestem chlebem żywym, który stąpił z nieba, jeśli kto spożywa ten chleb, będzie żył na wieki. Chlebem, który ja dam, jest moje ciało za życie świata. Sprzeczali się więc między sobą Żydzi, mówiąc, jak on może nam dać swoje ciało do spożycia. Rzekł do nich Jezus, zaprawdę, zaprawdę powiada wam, jeżeli nie będziecie spożywali ciała Syna Człowieczego i nie będziecie pili krwi Jego, nie będziecie mieli życia w sobie. Kto spożywa moje ciało i pije moją krew, ma życie wieczne, ja go wskrzeszę w nieostatecznym. Ciało moje jest prawdziwym pokarmem, a krew moja jest prawdziwym napojem. Kto spożywa moje ciało i krew moją pije, trwa we mnie, a ja w nim. Jak mnie posał, żyjący ojciec, a ja żyję przez ojca, tak i ten, kto mnie spożywa, będzie żył przeze mnie. To jest chleb, który z nieba stąpił. Nie jest on taki, jak ten, który jedli wasi przodkowie, a po umieraniu. Kto spożywa ten chleb, będzie żył na wieki. Oto słowo Pańskie. Chwała Tobie, Chryste. Let us pray. Pożegnajmy zmarłą siostrę świętej pamięci Stefanie. Przez całe życie pracowała i cierpiała z Chrystusem. Służyła swojej rodzinie i bliźnim, którzy potrzebowali pomocy. Wiemy, że dobre czyny idą za nią przed Boży Tron. Dlatego z ufnością polecajmy ją miłosierdziu Bożemu w naszej modlitwie. Tobie Boże pokornie polecamy naszą siostrę świętej pamięci Stefanie, którą darzyłeś wielką miłością w całym życiu doczesnym i prosimy, abyś teraz uwolnił ją od zła wszelkiego i dał jej wieczny pokój. Dla naszej siostry świętej pamięci Stefani przeminęło już życie ziemskie. Błagamy Cię zatem, miłosierny Boże, abyś prowadził ją do Twojego Królestwa, gdzie nie będzie już smutku, ani narzekania, ani bólu, lecz pokój i radość Twoim Synem i Duchem Świętym na wieki wieków. Amen. Almighty Father, eternal God, hear our prayers for your daughter Stephanie, whom you have called from this life to yourself. Grant her light, happiness, and peace. Let her pass in safety through the gates of death and live forever with all your saints in the light you promised to Abraham and to all his descendants in faith. Guard her from all harm, and on that great day of resurrection and and reward, raise her up with all your saints, pardon her sins, and give him give her eternal.
eternal life in your kingdom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I will, please be seated. I won't keep you guys too much longer. Um, it's getting kind of warm in here. Is it anybody warm? No? no. Maybe it's me. <laughs> um, just two more things I want to share with you. Um, I've started a website, holocaustheroin.com, um, that's kind of a tribute to my mom, I'm pulling all of these stories together, whatever videos I have that I can legally use and aren't copyrighted. Um, putting up there and uh, it'll continue to grow. I'm going to add something for my father too and kind of bring the two of them together But there's just one thing that I did want to share with you about my dad and um, uh, An experience that we had When I was younger when I learned about what happened with my parents um, I thought to myself, you know if I ever come across one of these German guys that espouses this negativity I was young, I thought to myself, I'm just gonna put a bullet in his head. And um, I, when I came to LA, I uh, took a scuba diving class. And um, I moved from Boston, I just wanted to meet people. So I was in this class, and one of the guys that I became friends with was German, big guy. And um, we, both had, we both had Asian girlfriends, so we clicked. Um, <laughs> We, we were driving through the Fairfax district one night. Uh, I won't share his name yet because I haven't talked to him about this, but we were driving through the Fairfax district, me, him, and his girlfriend in the back seat, and these two Orthodox Jewish men are walking across the street, you know, wearing the, what the Pesas and the Yamakas and all that. So he's sitting beside me, and we're, it's late, and he just, out of the blue, just says, um, my girlfriend won't let me burn them. What? And then he says, Adolf didn't finish the job. Do you know what the hell you're talking about? 27 people in my father's family were murdered by people like you? I didn't know you were Jewish. You don't look like Jew. What does a Jew look like? What are you talking about? So we got into it. Um, I was furious. Drove home. Silently, I called up my dad the next morning and I told him the story. And I said, You know, Pop, I'm going to kill this kid, guy. So, my father, on the other end of the line in Boston, I'm in LA, he says to me, Is he a friend? I said, He was a friend. And he says, Well, I was blown away by what my dad said. He said, Be his friend. Don't bring the hatred from the past into the past. Don't bring it forward. There's something along those lines. He says, don't, don't perpetuate the hatred. Just be his friend. So we got to talking about it. It turns out his family was Nazis. They were prominent Nazis in Germany, in a little small little town in Germany. And we got to talking about that, about the experiences. And he said, yeah, you either run with the wolves or you get eaten by the wolves. Yeah, OK, I get that to a degree, I, I guess. So um, he watched Hidden in Silence, um, and he met my dad. They got to actually get along really well. They, were, they, got, they told jokes together. Um, but there was a, an incident. You know, we were young, we would drive around, and we got cut off in, somewhere in LA by a carload of um, young black women. So we yelled out. I yelled something like, um, nothing to do with race, nothing to do with um, um, their gender. I'm from Boston. We yell. We honk. That's what we do. So I yelled at them. I used an expletive. And he says, well, you didn't call them the or say anything about the women thing. Said, Why? They're just being jerks. So he went back to Germany. His father owned a trucking company in this small town. And I guess they're prominent there. And he came back a few years later, and we had lunch. And he said to me, you know something? You really opened my eyes. Your dad opened my eyes. I said, what do you mean? He says, I went back to Germany. And he says, I realized I was surrounded by the hatred. I grew up with the hatred. We're, they're backwoods back there. 
He said, and I don't like it. And we were in a Thai restaurant, Marina Del Rey, and he started to sob. This guy's a big freaking gorilla, you know, and he's, he's sobbing in front of me. And that's because my dad didn't want to continue the hatred. He's, he, in his words, he said, the hatred stops here. So I, I, I owe a lot to my dad for, you know, for just being a human being. Last thing I want to share with you, um, actually, before I do, does anybody want to share anything? Does anybody have a story to tell? <laughs> Did he? I don't know, because we were embarrassingly in apologetic grades. On cue. Did you, have you talked about what Fusha's mother told her that governed her life? No, May please, I? yes. Uh, first of all, I loved her. She was funny. She was a woman who believed in the power of a good girdle. She <laughs> was, I'm so sorry. Um, she was flirtatious. She loved good-looking guys always. Um, I knew, I knew that Joe was her strength through so much of this, and that Helena was amazing. Helena. I said, well, I didn't know. That's fine. So, tell me that. That's but one day, Fusha told me that when she was little, her mother had said to her, if you ever see anyone in trouble who needs help, you help them. It doesn't matter who, what, you help them. And that was what she took with her through life. And I'm not going to be able to say much more than that. Mm. I'm so grateful to her. Thank you, Liz. All right, so I'm getting the, uh, and, and we're going to wrap this up. So, uh, I told you, the get-go, I tend to go on. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody else want to share anything, something to say? It's fine if you don't. Um, OK, I guess we're going to take Mom over to the graveside. Uh, everybody, too, by the way, you're invited to a reception at um, Castaway Restaurant uh, after this. It basically starts around 12, 15 or so. Um, and um, so, what's next? Well, I just want to start by saying thank you to all of you for being here. And the family does truly appreciate all your presence. Um, in a few minutes, I do want to give everybody the opportunity to walk by the casket and pay your respects. Once we have walked by the casket, we are going to be exiting these doors to my right. Now we are going to see a funeral coach. If we just wait by the funeral coach, we are going to have the opportunity to see when the casket is being placed into the coach. After that, we're going to go ahead and return to our cars, and the funeral coach is going to go through the main parking lot, and we're just going to follow behind procession where we will be taking her to her place of rest. And once again, thank you all very much for being here, and please feel free to extend your condolences to the family here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, everybody, for coming.
W stronę słońca, w stronę słońca, aż po horyzontu kres. Iść ciągle, iść tak bez końca, witać jeden przebudzony właśnie dzień. Wciąż witać go, jak nadziei dobry znak. Z ufnością tą, z jaką pierwszą jasność odśpiewuje tak. Iść 
ciągle być w tej podróży, którą ludzie prozaicznie życiem zwą. Iść, ciągle iść, jak najdłużej. Za plecami mieć nadciągającą noc. Z najprostszych słów Twój poranny składać wiersz W kolorach dwóch Raz zobaczyć to, co niewidzialne jest Iść, ciągle iść, trafiać celnie Zawianej piaskiem trawę ślad 